So, uh, without further ado, here is the language. <laughs> um, in the meantime, it is still the uh, best and uh, most complete um, low-level language design. Um, the uh, design was completed uh, sometime in the first half of this year. It has been forwarded to uh, ISO and we expect that there will be an official standardization announced uh, by the end of this year. So the official name is ADA 2012. As soon as it comes out, uh, Springer will publish the reference manual as it has previously and uh, the language uh, <coughs> will be ready for study by everybody. In the meantime, there are uh, several uh, resources uh, in which you can check things. Um, this is the uh, general website uh, that contains the discussions of the ARG and the reference manuals of previous versions of the language. Um, a resource that is particularly interesting is this one here, uh, which is the annotated reference manual. That one is normally not published on paper, and it contains a lot of the motivation for the design decisions. The reference manual is uh, quite uh, neutral in its tone and presents things as they are. Uh, the annotated reference manual has here and there a comment that says, to be honest, uh, that refers to a particular uh, complex uh, feature of the language or design pathology that is not being addressed and that will uh, remain on the wraps until the next revision of the language and so on and so forth. So uh, it is actually an extremely good reference if you want to understand how the design has evolved. And uh, finally, um, this uh, website here has uh, the uh, discussions on every single ADA issue that is addressed uh, by the design committee. The design committee, the uh, ARG, uh, works uh, more or less continuously <coughs> excuse me, on the basis of <coughs> submissions by members of the ADA community, including of course the members of the ARG, uh, and um, these uh, issues become uh, design points for the next version of the language. Uh, these design issues are typically classified in a number of uh, categories. Uh, the first one is uh, confirmation. Somebody asked a question, is it really the case that this works this way? So a confirmation roughly means you shouldn't have to ask. Um, <clears throat> and then there are um, uh, clarifications, uh, there are binding interpretations. Uh, those are comments about uh, something in the reference manual that appears to be incorrect. So a binding interpretation typically means uh, where the manual says white, read black. So it's an admission of a bug in the reference manual, roughly speaking. And then there are the ones that are amendments, and those are the ones <coughs> that become part of the next um, version of the language. And what I'm going to discuss here, of course, is mostly the, uh, the amendments. So uh, there are uh, around 300 ADA issues, needless to say. Uh, I will not discuss all of them. There's a large laundry list of things. And I'll try to focus on what appears to be uh, most important about uh, the new uh, language. So um, these appear to be the most interesting point uh, to discuss. Um, the, uh, the big one is program correctness. Everything that has to do with ensuring that your programs are closer to doing what you want uh, than previously. Um, this involves a, <clears throat> a certain amount of syntactic machinery uh, and uh, a number of new constructs to describe the intent of the program and we're going to discuss these in some detail. Um, there are also uh, helps in programming ideas that just possibly might have existed in other languages and that just make the language more expressive, in particular things having to do with iterators. Um, the library itself has been much enlarged. There's always the sense that the um, ADA library is smaller and uh, more restrictive than that of other languages. This has been uh, to some extent fixed. Uh, there are a number of uh, new uh, constructs uh, for programming in the small that are particularly useful uh, and uh, that mix very well with the issue of, program of how to express uh, the intent of the program, uh, the subject of program correctness. 
Um, there is a whole uh, slew of um, uh, interesting additions that have to do with concurrent programming and in particular with multi-cores. And uh, there are some interesting explicit constructs whose intent is to make it easier uh, to get uh, the best possible performance out of these new architectures. Uh, this is truly brand new in the sense that the implementation is extremely recent and the applications haven't appeared and there is still active discussion about how this is really going to be mapped to new architectures, but it is there in the language. And uh, finally, there are, uh, for hardcore um, language lawyers, issues having to do with uh, anonymous access types and accessibility issues uh, that uh, only the few uh, will be concerned with. I should add that it's a little odd for me to be giving this presentation. The main, the designer in chief of the language is here. There are several members of the ARG present, uh, Robert, uh, Gary, uh, and uh, Steve Baird, who holds the record for the largest number of semantic complications that can dance on the hand of a pin. Uh, <laughs> so uh, if you have deep, deep questions about the resulting design, they'll be happy to answer them. <laughs> okay, so uh, the big issue and the thing that I think we can make the most out of in terms of uh, indicating the interest of the language is uh, everything that has to do with program correctness. So um, there is a general mechanism to describe, again, the intent of, uh, uh, of the program, and uh, these address subprograms, types, and subtypes through three uh, different uh, mechanisms. So uh, what they are is a general form of an assertion. I say that when this procedure is called, uh, the following variable uh, will be updated in the following way. Uh, or I guarantee that uh, whenever an object of this type is constructed, uh, then uh, all its internal components are less than seven. Um, and uh, these are uh, therefore in the uh, nature of verification statements. And uh, they're addressed uh, to the compiler, uh, to a possible static tool that might verify that indeed what you've written satisfies these conditions. Um, or uh, to the runtime, in which uh, case uh, they mean that there are assertions that will be uh, checked and that may raise an exception if uh, they happen to fail. Okay? Now, um, conceptually, these are also addressed to the reader, and this is probably uh, something that needs to be emphasized on again, again, and again. They're aimed at the reader and at the writer of the program. Uh, the philosophy of the language is that uh, a heavy declarative machinery allows the compiler to do a better verification that what you've written makes sense. It forces you to make explicit what you have in mind, and out of this, hopefully, better programs come. So this is another mechanism which, for uh, programmers in the C school, means another burden of stuff that you have to write, uh, but from our point of view, is something that will help you conceptualize the program better. So the three um, uh, mechanisms are, uh, excuse me, uh, pre and post conditions that address subprograms, uh, type invariants that address uh, opaque private types, and subtype predicates that, uh, for the most part, will relate to uh, scalar subtypes and will allow you to describe subtypes that are not contiguous in values. So. Um, all of this is uh, presented by means of one uh, new syntactic machinery, which is called an aspect specification. We'll speak about this in a second. So, uh, typical example, we have a uh, package uh, that uh, offers an uh, interface for stacks. Uh, and uh, there are <coughs> some functions uh, defined. And we say, oh, sorry that the procedure push uh, has a precondition, that is to say, uh, a, um, a statement of what must be true before this routine is called. Uh, and the precondition is that the stack is not full when you want to push something on it, assuming that it has a finite capacity. And uh, the post condition is that uh, this uh, stack is not empty on return. So um, pre and post conditions are 
I have to confess it, an old idea in programming languages. Uh, this has been around for about half a century, ever since formal methods were um, uh, proposed as a way of verifying the correctness of programs. Uh, this is uh, the first time that they're integrated in a mainstream language in such a um, uh, direct way. Uh, previously, the one language that I can think that had something closely related is Eiffel, where uh, uh, en uh, ensures and requires were the two names for these, uh, these notions. In any case, the precondition indicates a constraint that the caller of the subprogram must obey if he expects the subprogram to work. So if the precondition is not met, the call doesn't take place at all, and the caller is told uh, the question makes no sense. Um, the post condition is more for the implementer of the subprogram, and it says when the subprogram returns, it guarantees the following effects uh, on the calling parameters, on the result returned, and so on and so forth. So um, the, the general term that is used to describe this is programming by contract. Uh, the contract is established between the caller and the, uh, the writer, or if you want, between the client of an API and the author of the API. And the contract says that if the caller satisfies the precondition, the callee guarantees that the postcondition will hold on return. Okay. And um, this notation here, with, uh, is an example of an aspect specification. So um, the uh, pre and post conditions uh, are presented then whenever you have a subprogram, they appear in the, uh, uh, in the, to be useful, they have to be visible to the client and uh, to, the, uh, um, uh, to the writer, uh, and therefore they're in the visible part of a, um, of a package. And as I said, uh, they can be verified dynamically uh, by the, uh, by the runtime. They're trans translated into assertions, or uh, this is for the time being uh, uh, more hypothetical, verified by the compiler, but certainly verified by a static analysis tool that could say, uh, in fact, the code that you have written will not satisfy this post condition. But for now, the implementation is that all these things become um, uh, tr they are translated into tests and um, exception uh, raises. Um, we are in an object-oriented world, so the issue of how um, uh, these pre- and post-conditions relate to uh, inheritance must be addressed. And as you notice in the previous example, uh, we can specify that a uh, pre- or a post-condition uh, is class-wide. What this means um, is that uh, they're inherited whenever uh, you override a, the primitive of a parent, uh, which makes sense uh, if uh, you want to uh, specify that on a parent type this condition obeys, and you then extend this type, being that you can always convert back to a parent type, you want to make sure that the extension does not violate uh, what you have stated as a precondition on the whole class. On the other hand, you can also specify a pre and a post condition that just applies to a particular uh, subprogram, and then it will not uh, be inherited when the program is overridden. Um, this um, uh, machinery can be enabled or disabled. There is a uh, mode uh, that specifies how much checking is being done. And uh, just as for constraint checks, you can turn this off uh, at runtime, uh, or you can enable it so that the uh, conditions are generated. And uh, the implementation uh, is neutral as to where these uh, checks are being made. Uh, conceptually, uh, you want uh, the precondition to be done at the point of call, that is to say, before you call, you check that the precondition is, uh, is correct. And the post condition uh, would apply uh, typically at the end of the cold subprogram, but in fact it can be uh, implemented with the checks on either place as, long, as soon as you respect the semantics. Uh, in the case of GNAT, actually, uh, we create one uh, <coughs> larger uh, subprogram 
uh, that is embedded in a given procedure that contains all the checks and raises the exceptions. As I mentioned, all of this makes use of this new uh, syntactic mechanism and aspect uh, specification, uh, which is a very general mechanism to attach properties to declarations. Um, it has a large number of advantages over previous mechanisms in the language, mostly pragmas and uh, attribute definition clauses, because it applies directly to the entity. It is part of the declaration of the entity. Uh, for example, uh, here we have uh, a type de uh, declaration and we indicate something that otherwise would have required a pragma <coughs> attached directly to it. Um, and uh, this one um, is uh, an indication of why this is a good idea. You may recall that before pragma inline applied to all the entities with that name that preceded the pragma. So very often you had a number of overloadings and you didn't want necessarily to make all of them have this particular uh, characteristic. And there was no simple way uh, short of using a renaming of saying, I just want this one to be in line. Now, there is no question, the thing appears directly at the point of the declaration that is relevant. Uh, here you have an example of multiple aspects for a single declaration, uh, and uh, uh, the syntax is trivial, the arrow separates the name of the aspect from its value. Uh, the value must be of a type that corresponds to the uh, aspect. Uh, and uh, successive aspects are separated by commas. The syntax is extremely simple and uh, intuitive. Um, additional machinery, uh, which is very useful in pre and post conditions um, for these imperative languages where there is state and things change their value. Um, uh, X tick old uh, denotes uh, the value of some expression, some entity, on entry to the subprogram. And you can use it in post conditions uh, to compare in some way with what happens on exit to the subprogram. Uh, so uh, this is a trivial example. Uh, you know, it's a, the, the typical, uh, this is a useless comment, increment variable by one. Uh, well, the post condition could be uh, x is now x tick old plus one for a procedure that uh, counts. Uh, and uh, a separate attribute is needed to describe the result of a function. Uh, and it's a uh, tick result, obviously. And both of these can only be used in post conditions. You cannot use them in, uh, in code otherwise. And uh, here is a somewhat uh, more challenging post condition. You have a uh, function in your trigonometric library. And you might want to guarantee that the result is, in general, less than 1. Um, and, uh, you know, if you have a series expansions of the sine function, it, it might take a little work to determine that this uh, post condition is true. Okay. Um, in general, um, good form says that post conditions don't have side effects uh, because it is extremely hard to reason uh, about their behavior if the post conditions themselves modify uh, the environment. Because then the semantics of the program might be different if the post conditions are enabled or not. Um, there was a long discussion in the ERG about a, a way of phrasing this. Um, and there were, of course, arguments for the need uh, for side effects because uh, differentiating between harmful and uh, benign side effects is uh, essentially semantically impossible. Uh, people always bring out the idea of a memo function, for example, or a counter of some sort. You want to know how many times you've gone through this. And this is a side effect. It's modifying the state, but of course has no uh, particular impact on the uh, semantics of the program. So that should be allowed. So uh, how can you say that this is allowed, but other more complicated side effects are forbidden? So there is no general rule, therefore. The language cannot enforce anything uh, here. Uh, I had a discussion with Quentin the other day, um, uh, who, uh, coming from uh, some deep immersion in other persuasions, namely he's been doing a lot of Java and C++, found an extremely clever way of uh, using post conditions to verify that some invariant of the parent was always called when the uh, subprogram was being called, and is something that had quite fierce side effects, as a matter of fact. And uh, we had a uh, friendly discussion on whether this was a proper way, a proper use of this new feature or not. Uh, the argument is not settled. 
Okay, the second uh, mechanism that refers to uh, assertions about behavior of things is a type invariant. Uh, and uh, a type invariant is something that applies to a private type. It is intended to represent some kind of consistency on the internals of the type. And it only makes sense for types that are private so that the client cannot modify components of it because then verifying that the invariant holds would be much more costly and the places at which it should be verified just multiply through the program. So the idea is that this is a requirement or an imposition on the uh, subprograms that manipulate such a type and in particular that create such a type. <clears throat> Um, so the uh, aspect is called type invariant uh, and um, a typical example here. Uh, the main thing is that uh, in general the nature of the invariant is a call to a function uh, that you otherwise do not necessarily see. All of this is, uh, is private. Uh, just as in the case of uh, subprograms, uh, there are issues with inheritance, so there are type invariants that are type-specific and uh, class-wide type invariants that are inherited by all the descendants. So the invariant then guarantees the integrity of an object, and uh, the language specifies where you check that this type invariant holds. So uh, these are essentially post-conditions on things that manipulate this type. Okay. So, um, Whenever you create an object of the type, you will want to verify that uh, the uh, conversion holds, the uh, invariant holds. Whenever you convert to the type, uh, whenever you return from a function, uh, or when you return from a subprogram that has an uh, out parameter or an in out parameter of that type. Now, this is only true for the operations that are visible to a user of the type. The point is that inside the package that has uh, access to the internals of that type, you might modify it in any way you want, and between two calls, it might very well be that the invariant doesn't hold. But once it returns to a user, the invariant must hold. Okay? So there is a distinction between the visible subprograms that muck with that thing and the private subprogram that are allowed to do whatever they want. The visible subprogram must obey uh, the, uh, must respect the invariant. Okay. So you can combine these things, of course, if you have a, uh, a private type uh, that has components in some fashion that are uh, themselves uh, private, you create an object of this uh, composite entity and then the invariant uh, of the whole thing must be respected and the invariant of the components must be respected as well. So uh, there's quite a bit of machinery that gets developed to ensure that the invariants are respected. Okay. So uh, here you have a little uh, hierarchy uh, with a root type, a child and a grandchild. And um, the uh, root has a... Um, uh, class-wide type invariant, the child has a class-wide type invariant, and the grandchild has a type-specific type invariant. Whenever you create a grandchild, you will have to, create, to verify the invariance um, of all three of them to make sure that the object is uh, proper, uh, regardless of the view that you have of it. Something to be mentioned. Um, what happens is that in all of the, in all of these aspects, very often you will mention something that you have not seen yet. So this is, again, one uh, break in the rule of linear elaboration in, uh, uh, in ADA. Uh, you will typically have forward references to things that you have, uh, and particularly subprograms that you haven't seen yet. Well, subtype predicates uh, are a, uh, an orthogonal mechanism, uh, and they apply to types of structures visible. Um, and, uh, for example, uh, you have here a record and you impose a condition on a component of the record, uh, an arithmetic condition. Um, you can specify a predicate for any subtype. Uh, these are not constraints in the sense that they don't create uh, a, um, uh, a constrained subtype. This is just a predicated subtype. 
Uh, and it appears that the most common use for them uh, will be to create uh, enumeration types or uh, essentially scalar types with non-contiguous ranges. Uh, and uh, this is something that uh, we find the need for constantly. Uh, we uh, need uh, subtypes of uh, uh, some kind of discrete type and we uh, want uh, the elements from uh, uh, A to C and the elements from X to Z and uh, there is no current simple way of describing this. Uh, the language defines two classes of predicates, uh, static predicates and dynamic predicates. Uh, GNAT chooses to conflate both and as a matter of fact they're both translated into predicate um, but uh, there are semantic differences between them that GNAT does uh, respect. Um, the static predicates are those that in fact could be evaluated statically uh, in, uh, in certain cases and just like static expressions are clear rules if the predicate has a particular syntactic form and the argument uh, is uh, statically known and then the predicate can be evaluated statically. The dynamic predicates cannot. So uh, here is a, uh, a simple case. You have a, um, a predicate on a uh, uh, scalar uh, subtype and uh, the predicate uh, is expressed as a essentially a composite membership test and in fact all of this could be written in uh, ADA 2012 as a membership test. Uh, we'll discuss that later on. And the main thing is that if you create a value that is definitely not out of that subtype, the compiler can verify that that value doesn't belong. Okay. Uh, well, it's, it's like a, uh, an expression that creates a constraint error. In some cases it's a warning, in some other cases it's going to be an error. Okay. But the main thing is that they are defined so that the static evaluation is possible uh, without the data flow or any uh, complex machinery added to the compiler. Uh, dynamic predicates are anything. It is some assertion about what this thing is. Uh, for example, I might define a subset of the uh, uh, positive numbers that happens to be prime. Uh, so um, it's going to be very hard for the compiler to compute this predicate uh, statically. So um, these uh, non-contiguous uh, scalar types of course present a problem if you want to use them uh, for example as uh, uh, the basis for, uh, as the index type for an array uh, and uh, the attributes uh, first, the last and range um, become doubtful because it may be that the first of the base type just doesn't belong to the subtype. So where is the first of the subtype? So there was quite a bit of discussion on whether we should try to define those things properly, but they all seem to imply possibly uh, a sequential search through the range of the base type to find uh, elements of the subtype. So this seemed unacceptable and uh, therefore uh, these attributes, uh, first, last, and range, cannot be applied to a subtype with predicates. Okay, uh, next uh, important topic is containers. Uh, this is more of a uh, grab a bag, except for the issue of iterators. So um, the uh, container library is a very interesting addition to ADA 2005. Uh, it is a little limited in various ways. So there are a number of new uh, container forms that have been added uh, and uh, there is uh, the issue of uh, having iterators built into the language uh, which are the obvious ways of manipulating uh, data collections. So the first thing is uh, bounded containers. Uh, containers um, typically have to use dynamic memory. There are dynamic structures. Uh, and there are many uh, applications, in particular high integrity ones, in which the use uh, of uh, dynamic storage allocation is forbidden. Uh, and uh, therefore you cannot use containers to uh, program these things. This is inconvenient to say the least. So now uh, there is a, um, a whole family of containers uh, which, um, needless to say, carry some capacity uh, indication. Uh, there are discriminated types. When you create such a container, it has a fixed a size once and for all. And if you add too many elements to them, you will get an exception. Uh, and the main thing is that once you have this bounded size, they can be stack allocated, not use dynamic storage at all, and therefore be usable in high integrity contexts. So you have those for vectors, lists, 
uh, sets, uh, maps, uh, hashed sets, uh, ordered sets, and so on and so forth. So um, no great <coughs> conceptual leap here, but uh, this is certainly uh, an extremely useful thing to have at hand. The holder container is the, uh, the, the singleton of uh, object-oriented lore. Uh, the problem is that the language uh, has no way of allowing you to describe an unbounded object, an object that doesn't have uh, some size constraint. I cannot say that X is going to be uh, a TTIC class without initializing it with something, uh, at which point, well, it becomes constrained. But you would really like to have something that can hold the value of um, any element of the class. But that's an uh, unconstrained type, and you cannot create an unconstrained object without giving an initial value. Awkward. So uh, there is now a container whose purpose is to hold one element of the class. Uh, that is to say, to hold one uh, indefinite uh, value. Uh, so, uh, like all the, all the containers, it is a, uh, a generic package that exports uh, this uh, um, uh, type holder, uh, which is parameterized by the kind of thing you put into it. And the kind of thing you put into it uh, has unknown discriminants and is therefore of an indefinite type. Um, something that people had remarked at various times is that there were no tree uh, containers. Um, you know, a, a container library is essentially uh, the, the, the lore of data structures 101, uh, all the useful things that you learn to do early on in programming, and the absence of any sort of trees, balance trees, AVL trees, uh, B trees, or whatever, uh, was seen as somewhat of a lack. So, uh, <coughs> the universalist approach that Ada takes. This is the most general kind of tree you can possibly have, except it's not balanced. Um, it is a, a multi-way tree, that is to say, every node has an array of descendants, uh, and that array itself is, in, is, a, is unbounded. So um, you can traverse this tree in all possible ways, uh, because there are pointers up and down, so uh, you can go down from uh, one parent to a child, you can traverse all the children of a given node, you can traverse a subtree, and so on and so forth. Um, otherwise, uh, the standard operations on trees appear. You can insert uh, under a given uh, uh, parent, you can insert at the end of a list of children, and so on and so forth. So it's a very uh, general uh, linked structure. Uh, where it's still characteristic of a tree that a given node has a single parent. And um, there are also uh, indefinite versions of it uh, and uh, bounded versions of it. So that's uh, nothing new here. Okay, uh, queues are another um, uh, missing component in, previous, uh, in the previous version of the library. And uh, the idea was that uh, these are really trivial data structures. Everybody can write that one. Well, uh, if you want it to be task safe, uh, it is not that trivial, and you might want to be um, one. Uh, you might want to have one in the library that is predefined, that has an efficient implementation, and that indeed is guaranteed to be reentrant if you have several tasks manipulating a single queue. So there are now a variety of queues in the library, and uh, the main thing is that they all. Uh, <coughs> Uh, implemented this particular uh, interface, um, uh, ADA container synchronized queue interfaces, and the main thing is that you might implement this by means of a task that manipulates this queue, or by means of protected types that uh, uh, manage uh, the queue uh, without having a thread that actually holds it, and uh, therefore uh, thanks to the great unification of tasks and protected types in the previous version of the language, you just say this type is a synchronized interface. And then uh, once this is defined, uh, the library includes various uh, implementations of this uh, interface for bounded queues. Again, something that you could use in a high integrity context, unbounded queues, and also priority queues. Now, uh, things that are syntactic innovations in the language. 
<coughs> there are um, a couple things to be said about functions. The most important uh, part of this is the uh, iterators for uh, all containers. Um, I have uh, given here um, the uh, reference manual and the uh, ADA issue that discusses this if you're interested in the history uh, for each one of them. Uh, so this is probably the most important thing, uh, the notion of uh, having iterators over uh, uh, containers. Um, similar contracts do exist in a few other languages. Um, and it was felt that given that we have containers, it would be nice to have a general syntax to describe how you search through them, how you, uh, how you traverse them. There are already uh, in all the container uh, li um, uh, packages uh, functions that do that, but a more general mechanism seemed to be missing. Um, the idea of an iterator um, is interesting, is that of reifying the process of traversing this data structure. So an iterator becomes a thing, uh, and the advantage of a thing is that you can pass it around. So it's conceivable to have a construct that starts uh, looking at uh, the contents of a given data structure, and then you send the iterator somewhere else for some other procedure to continue the iteration. This is the advantage of having this notion of reifying the iterator. So um, this could have been uh, done essentially by adding magic to the language. We have this construct that does the following. Okay? Uh, but uh, Tucker uh, took a more interesting approach and um, essentially did a deconstruction of that magic into uh, smaller pieces of uh, magic, each one of which has an interesting use. And um, it is the introduction of a generalized reference, um, the introduction of a generalized indexing aspect, uh, and, uh, well, some minor stuff uh, involving incomplete types, not too uh, much less relevant. So, the goal of it, among other things, is to allow you to say the following. Uh, do some operation to everything that's in this, in this container. And we want to be able to use this syntax for all of them, uh, regardless of the internal structure, not having to know what their in internal structure is. And uh, we might want to do this by speaking directly about the contents of it and not worry about a pointer or index that denotes each one of them. Okay, so um, being able to write this is really the uh, great advantage of this new um, machinery. So um, the first bit of uh, magic is this introduction, introduction of, of course, a new aspect, uh, which is called an implicit dereference. And the idea is that we can define a type um, that is essentially a wrapper around a pointer. So the type uh, has an access discriminant, that is to say a discriminant that is itself uh, a, uh, an access type, a reference to something. And then when you mention an object of the type, if the context requires it, what you look at is what that access discriminant points to. So you have an implicit dereference that given the object actually speaks about what this object is pointing to. Okay, so uh, this is the typical example. The type uh, may have whatever other contents, but the main thing is that it has an access discriminant. And then it has an aspect that says this access discriminant is actually subject to an implicit dereference. Okay, so uh, then if I have a, um, a function in this case that manipulates something of the type, then in a context where what I would really need is whatever the access discriminant points to, then this is what I get. So I can say, uh, find in this uh, um, container <coughs> uh, a reference, to, uh, well, uh, whatever is associated with this particular value. The function has a key that is a string. And uh, this actually, uh, is a uh, value of uh, type wrapper because this is what the function find uh, returns. But wrapper has an implicit dereference. So what we do is actually get the thing that is pointed at by data and I can update it in, in this fashion. Uh, the second bit of magic is the introduction of a general indexing. 
um, <coughs> which means that uh, you can use an object as a prefix, syntactically, of an indexing operation. And uh, this means that essentially you can define a mapping function on anything that is an object and make it look like the general use of an index on an array. Okay, so uh, you extend the notion uh, so that instead of an array you can speak about if a container and instead of an index you can speak about a cursor into that container. So a cursor uh, is indeed uh, like an index, something that denotes a component of a composite structure. Okay. <clears throat> so I want to be able to write uh, my bag of that one just the way I write array sub 5. Okay. So uh, this requires then that we define a function <coughs> uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, which denotes the aspect variable indexing. So there are two uh, kinds of uh, aspects here, one variable indexing and one uh, constant indexing. Uh, one of them returns something that is mutable and the other one returns something that must be a constant. Okay. So uh, once again, this replaces this um, rather uh, heavy notation <coughs> excuse me, uh, that involves function calls and implicit dereferences uh, with a, a very uh, a compact and uh, uh, telling um, uh, piece of code. So um, iterators essentially combine the two and um, the uh, basic uh, machinery is first of all uh, that of a um, predefined packages that uh, a predefined uh, package uh, that presents an interface with the basic operations for iteration which are going forward going back knowing when you're done and what is the type of the cursor that you use to denote things so this is uh, the uh, um, uh, built-in mechanism out of which all the containers with iterations are built. Okay, so every container um, instantiates this particular package and what you have to supply for it is uh, what is going to be the type of the cursor and uh, what is the boolean function that tells you whether you finish the iteration or not. Okay, and then uh, the operations that you will have to define are first, next, and well, of course, last, and so on and so forth. So, um, I always like to say that when you inherit an interface, what you do is like inheriting a mortgage. Uh, what you're doing is committing yourself to supplying those functions, of course. Uh, all you inherit here is the names of those things. And then, uh, for example, uh, <coughs> the uh, um, doubly linked list container now has the following form. Uh, first of all, uh, we uh, have to have this uh, inter the iterator interface in the context, and then a list, uh, as before, of course, it's a tag type. Uh, the user doesn't need to know the structure, it's private. But the main thing is that it defines the following aspects. Uh, there is a constant indexing when you want to traverse a list, but you don't want to allow the user to modify it in any way. Uh, there is a variable indexing when you want the user to be uh, <coughs> uh, able to modify the contents. Um, you uh, declare a function, a default iterator, that describes if you don't say anything else, this is the way I want to traverse the list. Uh, and uh, finally, you have to specify for this function uh, what is the element that it, uh, it, it returns. The advantage of exposing all this machinery is, of course, that you can define your own. Uh, so, <clears throat> in particular, um, the, you can define your own container packages and you can define your own iterate function uh, that will specify, for example, that you iterate over every second component of the list or only the multiples of seven or whatever you want. All of this is uh, accessible to the user. What I'm describing here is the predefined one, and this is the template that all of them follow. If you don't... Okay. Um, I think the, uh, the payoff is in the fact that you can write those things trivially. So um, you use the default uh, iterate uh, function in the, uh, uh, in the library, and you can say um, for all the cursors in, uh, in the, uh, that denote elements in the container, do the following to the, uh, to the element. So 
Um, container of cursor is precisely an example of uh, um, generalized indexing. I'm really treating the container as an indexable object, except that the indexing operation is whatever retrieval the data structure requires. Uh, and um, even better, uh, I can do the following where I can speak directly of the elements of the container without uh, speaking of this intermediate link of a cursor of an index. So uh, the syntax is a little different. The in is the previous one. Uh, if I say for things of box, uh, then I access directly the contents of the container without uh, the need for a pointer. Okay. Uh, small detail, uh, iterators do not apply to queues and they do not apply to the holder container where iteration wouldn't really be particularly <laughs> useful. <laughs> okay, um, something that uh, uh, seems like a very small issue but actually has been the subject of 20 years of discussions is whether functions should have in-out parameters or be in some mathematical sense pure functions that cannot modify their calling parameters. Uh, the discussion uh, has uh, uh, shifted and uh, finally uh, functions can have in-out parameters. Okay, so uh, uh, general rejoicing in 50% of the population, dismay in the other 50%. <laughs> in any case, it's there. So uh, one issue that this brings up is that now uh, side effects are uh, more dangerous, and this is a typical example of the issue. I have some expression that contains two function calls, and they happen to have a, uh, and let's assume that uh, this is precisely in-out parameters, and uh, the two uh, parameters happen to be the same or overlap in some way. So uh, it might well be that the side effect of the call will modify one of these parameters. So now the order of evaluation of these calls in the expression becomes a problem because the language does not specify the order of evaluation. So uh, the problem now is compounded uh, by the presence of these uh, side effects and the inability uh, to say in which order this will be evaluated. So the result becomes uh, non-deterministic and this of course is not good. So uh, the language now when uh, we have uh, expressions of this kind um, specifies some rules that make this safe by saying that the compiler must check that, that there is no overlap between objects that could, mo could be modified this way. So there's a pre very precise uh, description of um, what overlap might mean. Uh, one record and uh, one component of that record, one component of the array, another component of the array, and so on and so forth. Whenever there is the danger that in a, um, an expression there are several function calls with side effects that might have overlapping parameter, the compiler is supposed to reject this. Okay, uh, now a bunch of uh, smaller things uh, that are uh, worth mentioning. Conditional expressions, uh, membership tests, quantified expressions, expression functions, case expressions, aliasing predicates, all of these are small syntactic uh, forms that seem to be extremely useful. Uh, and uh, easy to describe, familiar from other languages, and in many cases will help a lot in writing contracts. The problem, the issue being that contracts will be some um, interesting, typically Boolean expressions, and uh, you want greater facility for writing those. So conditional expressions have been around uh, forever, uh, and they're now in the language. You can have an if expression, uh, <coughs> for um, parsing reasons in most contexts, these things have to be parenthesized, but not uh, uh, everywhere. Um, so you can have any number of else ifs and uh, so on and so forth. It's understood that all the branches of such an expression must have the same type. Uh, if this happens to be uh, class-wide types or access types, in particular uh, anonymous access types, <coughs> slight semantic complications, but uh, the, the use is perfectly obvious. Uh, membership operations now can have a much more general form. Before a membership was either uh, to a subtype or to a, uh, to a parent type, um, and now you can present a number of alternatives um, and uh, you can have, you can 
uh, string ranges and individual values in a single um, uh, membership test, and this is a uh, possible example. Uh, the main thing is to be able, the connection with subtypes, uh, to say that a given value is one of a list which is not, necessi not necessarily contiguous. So, um, a useful simple addition. Uh, expression functions are uh, functions uh, whose body consists of just one expression, and it turns out to be convenient to be able to write them online, so to speak. So an expression function can appear in a package specification, uh, and um, this is just a very uh, convenient shortcut. Uh, these can be used as uh, completions of previous declarations, so they can actually appear in the body, so they're, they're just a syntactic abbreviation. Um, and uh, a reminder that this is perhaps not a brand new idea. Okay. Uh, quantified expressions uh, come from um, uh, typical notation in symbolic logic. You want to express a predicate over all the contents of a given uh, composite data structure over a container. So it comes in two versions. There is a universally quantified expressions uh, for all the elements in this container the following holds. And the other one is the existentially quantified expression. Uh, there is some element of this collection that satisfies the following predicate. Uh, <coughs> for example, uh, to specify that something is sorted, you will say that uh, for all indices from the first to uh, the one right before the last, it is the case that each element is smaller than the next one. It's uh, not so far. Remember, you can at all times send a, a note to ADA comment uh, to suggest uh, improvements to the existing language, corrections, and so on and so forth. Uh, a little discussion uh, arose a week ago about what those uh, quantified uh, things mean over empty containers. And uh, um, I think that it's uh, um, Vasily who was particularly surprised uh, that if I say for all over an empty set, I get true. Uh, well, uh, it turns out that, that there is a long story be behind that decision, and you can uh, construct a model of set theory um, that is com perfectly consistent if you say that any iteration over an empty set returns false. Okay? We won't get into that discussion. It goes back to uh, 19th century Boole and, and, uh, and Lewis Carroll. Um, but the main thing is that you want to respect uh, this uh, identity that for all x there is a p of x is equivalent of saying it is not the case there is some x for which p of x is false. Okay, that's the uh, general equivalence. And in fact, the implementation of for all uh, has essentially this form. That is to say, you assume uh, something about the predicate and you traverse the collection until you find something that violates the predicate or satisfies the predicate and then you return the corresponding value. So it is natural to say this one. Is it the case that there is an x in the empty sets for which p of x holds? Well, no, because there is no, there is no x at all. So after this discussion, we decided that it was enough of a surprise that the compiler should give a warning when it is obvious that you're iterating over an empty range or an empty container. And now it says, remember, this is going to give you the value true if, it, if it's a universally quantified expression, etc. Okay, uh, we can skip this and um, we have to move forward. Uh, visibility mechanisms. Um, the interesting things here is that incomplete types now can appear in many more contexts and uh, there is yet another variant of a user clause. Um, and uh, let me remind you, um, you need use clauses to access things declaring a package using just a uh, direct name rather than a qualified name. So. Um, if I have a, a package here that defines various things, I cannot declare an object of this package without saying use the package. Now, it turns out, big uh, uh, controversy in, uh, in, in terms of uh, programming conventions, there are some people that find that use clauses are dangerous because they expose too much. It's a, it, it's a modesty argument, essentially. So uh, they want you to qualify everything. 
Uh, well, uh, okay, so uh, we write p dot t, and now we know, well, t is an integer, so I should be able to write a mathematical operation that uh, manipulates this. Well, no, you can't, because uh, the uh, times here is also something defined in the package, and I cannot use it directly like this uh, without making everything visible. So uh, the language introduced this intermediate construct, a use type. So if you say use type, you can use directly uh, the operators, the predefined operators of the type. So you get arithmetic and then this becomes legal. But now uh, we have uh, more general uh, primitive operations. We have, uh, for example, the literals in an enumeration type. There are a number of other names that you would like to use comfortably if you're referring to things of the type or even of a subtype of the type. So we now have uh, a, con a uh, use clause called use all type and then that one does what this one does and it also exports the names of the primitive operations of the type and of the uh, literals in the case of an enumeration type. Okay, so uh, a little bit more flexibility without opening completely um, the visibility to everything in the package. Okay, so uh, let's be brief here. Um, the uh, um, in, uh, <coughs> the International Real-Time ADA Workshop is a group of specialists in real-time programming that periodically uh, suggests um, enhancements to the language, in particular everything that has to do with concurrency, um, uh, scheduling mechanisms, and so on and so forth. And um, they have suggested a number of enhancements to the language that have become incorporated. Uh, all of these, as you can see, with one exception, I'll annex D, that is to say real time, and therefore there are things that uh, may only make sense at the level uh, of uh, bare boards or specialized operating systems, and that uh, therefore have a very targeted and small audience. Um, the um, most important uh, one, I think, uh, is the one that has to do uh, with mapping uh, multitasking programs on multiprocessors. It is what Tucker uh, mentioned uh, yesterday, uh, the need to um, be able to know how uh, a multi-threaded program makes best use of uh, the underlying architecture. So uh, the main thing is uh, the uh, creation of this notion of a dispatching domain, which is a subset of the constructs of the computational units that you have. So uh, it may mean the cores on a given chip, or it may designate the chip, or who knows, it may designate nodes in a network. But the main thing is that there is a way in the language of speaking of these units and of saying that a given task or a given group of tasks is attached to that unit or to that set of units. Okay, so for example, all these tasks will communicate a lot and I want them to be in some kind of cache coherent subset of the processor so they all go on this particular chip. Or these tasks are truly independent, I don't want them to have any bus interference so I'll put them far away, whatever. Uh, the main thing is that there's a way of speaking about that by means of this notion of dispatching domain. Okay. Now, here uh, the notion is extremely simple. Uh, there is a number of CPUs, whatever those things are, and a dispatching domain is a subset of these CPUs, and you define those things essentially uh, uh, statically or at, at program elaboration time, and then they become fixed. And then for a given task, you can say it will belong to that domain. Okay? And you can query to ask whether this task is currently on this domain or not complex uh, issues when you try to move a task from one domain to the other and so on and so forth. How well this will work uh, remains uh, to be seen. I think we don't have uh, much experience with it. Surprisingly, shortly after we released the first version that included that, we got a message from a user saying that he had a problem because um, running on Linux actually on some uh, multi-core uh, system, um, the operating system numbered the uh, uh, course in a particular order and what he needed for a dispatching domain was actually non-contiguous by that numbering. So there was no obvious way of describing this with this machinery. So um, ongoing discussion in the ERG how to handle this. The 
proper solution might be that this is still very implementation dependent. So we stick with this definition and then the implementation must describe for any given target how a given dispatching domain matches to whatever is underneath what the actual silicon is. So uh, this is work in progress. Uh, synchronous barriers, um, uh, anonymous access times and storage management. Uh, yes, uh, there is a discussion among members of the ERG of uh, what is the heart of darkness, uh, those places where nobody wants to go. Um, uh, one of the favorites is the one that speaks about accessibility checks. Uh, another favorite is the one that speaks about freezing rules. Uh, Steve, who actually knows uh, accessibility checks better than anyone, uh, thinks that the heart of darkness is the other one. Um, but in any case, there are additional rules to prevent you from uh, creating dangling pointers and these rules make perfect sense and guarantee that your program doesn't go off the rail and the understanding of these rules is left to the very dedicated language lawyers. Um, very small things. Um, there are uh, rules about the placement of pragmas that were always confusing. Uh, it says that a pragma can appear in a list if the list contains something else, or maybe not. In some cases, the pragma can be by itself. This is now simpler. Uh, you don't need to add in all statement. And uh, people know that we have an exit statement, that we don't have a continue statement, which is uh, so familiar from other uh, languages. How come? Well, you have to put a label and a go-to, but the label cannot stand by itself. You need to have a null statement there. This is a pain with the language. So uh, now you can actually have a label without um, anything else. It stands for a statement, so uh, the go-to goes directly to that label that precedes the end loop, and you've saved uh, about 200 pixels or something like this. <laughs> okay, so uh, <laughs> uh, Lewis Carroll is uh, good to quote at this point. And I think the symmetrical shape of the language has been preserved. This is a very uh, uh, organic growth uh, in the language, whether it's broken the uh, complexity uh, limit, I don't know. We'll see how well people adopt it, um, uh, but uh, yeah, we'll discuss this, and um, all of this is implemented, of course. <laughs> okay, it's implemented in the software present tense sense, that is to say, we're working on getting it right. Um, uh, <laughs> you are all encouraged to use the very latest version and bang into it to find the few bugs that no doubt remain. Uh, I must uh, thank Quentin in particular, who has been using the iterator and the indexing machinery very heavily recently uh, in ways that uh, somehow we had not quite expected. And uh, it is uh, very useful to have this kind of early testing. Yeah, um, now um, use them freely, uh, report whenever your foot goes through the partition. <laughs>